Okay, good afternoon. I'm Molly Gelbert, Senior Director of Delivery System and Payment Transformation um, at AHIP. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our next session, Scaling Innovation and Building Industry Collaboration and Alignment. In our session, our panel will discuss progress toward improving data sharing, promoting health equity, and advancing value-based payment and care delivery models. We know that fragmentation in healthcare contributes to multiple problems, including gaps in patient care, inefficiencies in clinical care and operations, poor flow of data, and misaligned incentives. It also creates increases in inequities. When patchworks of safety nets are fragmented and stretch their limits, patients may fall through the nets. Health insurance providers are working together with providers, technology partners, and other industry stakeholders to bridge gaps in care and data flow. They are examining the implications of a fragmented care system and taking steps to drive more coordinated collaborative care. Today we will examine how two organizations are building bridges and breaking down barriers to create a more cohesive healthcare system and looking into the entire healthcare ecosystem as a whole. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers before we begin. Um, we'll hear from Shruti Kathari. We'll also hear from Dr. Amit Shah. Thank you both for joining us for this discussion. So to kick things off, um, we'll have a brief pre presentation from both panelists that will talk about their organization's initiatives. And we will reserve about 10 minutes at the close of the session for question and answers. I lead something called Industry Initiatives for Blue Shield of California. Uh, and what we do essentially um, is we, Molly, you said it perfectly in terms of fragmentation in healthcare, but we know that healthcare is pretty broken. Um, there's competition, there's misaligned incentives, um, and that really leads to a lot of fragmentations in the system. So Blue Shield, we are testing a lot of different things for our healthcare transformation agenda. Um, but what we found is past pilot, in order to scale, a lot of these things get in the way. And so you need industry, you need to really focus on industry collaboration and progressive policy movement in order to support the scaling of these transformations. So that is what our group focuses on. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we do this work. But before I get there, you know, I do think that this is a relatively new concept in the industry of as more and more organizations are testing and trying to pilot and do things different in the, the name of transformation and innovation, the need for a group to really focus on uh, industry collaboration is needed and um, Blue Shield of California, this was about three years ago, they had the idea where they wanted to create a whole team uh, and a whole budget and resources to, to focus on this. And I think that is really important because I'll talk about some of the outcomes we've had, but none of that is possible without actual resources allocated to this. So I came on board about two years ago in July 2020 and the first six months was really uh, uh, trying to figure out what were the key priority areas to focus on and what would be the approach to actually make an impact. So you'll see kind of our iterative process like in the corner there. Uh, and I think it's worth highlighting that this work has to be very thoughtful and strategic, again, given how fragmented and how competitive and misaligned our industry can be. So we did spend a chunk of time doing that. And we landed on these three priority areas. So we focus on the social determinants of health, payment innovation and data sharing. And I'll go into each one of those, exactly what are we focused on and um, what have we done and what kind of outcomes have we seen. But the other area we really thought about, health equity has been something that of course is very important important always, but um, in the last two years we've seen really the disparities and the gaps just highlighted and emphasized during the pandemic. And so we thought, do we want to focus on health equity as a separate standalone focus area? But really at the end of the day, the reason why we do all of this work to create access, quality, you know, we are trying to reduce inequities and support everyone, right? Health equity is the basis of all the work that we do. So it's really important to call out all of the work that we do, the foundation is seen through a health equity lens. And so our targeted approach, it's a three-pronged approach where we have partnerships and that can take the form of 
former, or sorry, uh, formalized coalitions, or it can be convenings, building roadmaps, but it's essentially partnering with diverse stakeholders in, in the ecosystem to really amplify and propel what we're trying to do at, with our mission for each three of these things. The next is publications. It can be formalized white papers that we commission, um, op-eds, blogs, you name it. But it's really, again, amplifying whatever is happening on the partnership side to larger audiences and um, using influencers in, in all uh, across the spectrum of healthcare, whether you're big tech, whether you're health plans, providers, academics, doesn't really matter. And events in the same way. So I'll go over examples of all three and what this actually looks like. So in the first area for payment innovation, so our goal here um, is we have been testing at Blue Shield of California with value-based payment models. And we would love to scale these payment models, but we are just a subset of health plan contracts with large provider groups. So we need other health plans to align and also contract value-based in order to really make effective changes and impact here. We partnered, and actually I'm just gonna give a shout out to Joe Castiglione right here in the pink shirt, everybody, wave Joe. <laughs> and, um, he actually leads this work on the industry initiatives team and it's fantastic. You should definitely uh, reach out to him and talk to him after the session. But we uh, partnered with uh, P PBGH and IHA at, to essentially do some convenings with leading health plans in the state of California to talk about value-based payment models, to talk about quality metrics, to talk about how can we better support primary care practices. And so this work we engaged with them about 18 months ago, and I'm really happy to report that May 18th, we got six leading health plans in the state of California to agree um, to value-based uh, payment models because of this work that we did. And so on the partnership side of it, what they were doing is they were leading these convenings to have these discussions and building a roadmap of what that could look like. The next step is at MOU where executives from each one of these six health plans are going to sign and it's going to be publicly um, published essentially. So that commitment. But leading up until that point, of course we had the convenings, we also did publications. So what you see a screenshot right there is um, our, our white paper that we did at the end of last year, but we also did a lot of op-eds, blogs, um, again, elevating what was being discussed in those convenings and, and really trying to highlight the different voices and the use cases for why payment innovation matters in primary care. And the last is events. It's very teeny tiny, so you probably can't see who are the little speakers, but we did a three-part um, event series here where we had diverse folks come and speak on these panels. This was really important strategic messaging where often you get the same people talking about payment innovation and it can get really wonky. And what's really important in this is you need general influencers and executives at other health plans to buy into it, to understand, to agree. So you need to have buzzy people from different industries at the table talking about it. So we had folks like the CEO of Headspace Health talking about the importance of payment innovation in primary care, given that behavioral health, you know, primary care is often a front door and payment doesn't align. So things like this, how do you position it in a different way where it elevates and it reaches a whole different crowd of influencers? And the people that are participating in the convenings and the partnerships were attending our events and hearing this messaging. So when it came down to phone the final vote on May 18th, they had also been the participants of all our advocacy work essentially. Um, in data sharing, we launched, um, we were part of the, the initial group that launched a coalition called Connecting for Better Health. We were trying to pass legislation to support a statewide health information exchange in the state of California. And so when we started, it was a handful um, of folks. And today, there are over 230 organizations that participate in that coalition. And last year, we did. Um, we're able to pass AB 133, which is a statewide budget, budget trailer bill that supports um, data sharing mandate in the state of California. So again, months of advocacy work, a lot of um, education, a lot of events, a lot of publications. You'll see here, same thing. We published a white paper. We did a lot of op-eds. We also did another three-part series where we had different stakeholders at the table 
talking about this. We had folks like you know, Unite Us, Dan Broman, he's the CEO there, talking about how data sharing is really important for that work. We had VCs talking about it. We also had um, nonprofits and community health centers talking about it. So getting the diversity of folks is really, really important. Uh, social determinants of health, this is our newest um, undertaking. We started in January 2022, and we are partnering with health leads, um, big organizations like Common Spirits, uh, California Healthcare Foundation, and we are specifically focused on community-anchored referral networks. How do we build some infrastructure around that and support policies that actually support that work as well? We'll be publishing a white paper in fall of 2022, um, and we will also be doing a three-part event series. So it is really a replicable model where you can apply it to whatever um, based on, you know, like, again, partnerships, events, um, and publications, but there are some foundational things in how to move that. So I talk about this, and I want to tell you about some of our outcomes that we've been able to achieve. I mentioned that, so this program is about two years old, and I started in July 2022. We didn't really start the work until January 2021, because that's after the initial phase of trying to figure out what to focus on. But in the short time we've done this program, we've passed one piece of legislation, we've had two industry convenings, we've produced 10 publications, held 14 events with over 3,500 attendees. Um, we have 80, more than 80 industry partners and so on, as you can see. So a program like this really can impact and build industry collaboration, but I wanna go back to what I said first, which was, your, the organizations need to dedicate their resources to do this work. Blue Shield of California put in that work um, in terms of having a whole team focus on this um, with dollars attached to it so we could do this work, but we've also seen the outcomes uh, resulting from that work. And last but not least, you should definitely check us out. We have an external facing website where our papers are published. We have recordings of our events, upcoming events, all the different things. You can subscribe to our newsletter or you can just send us an email if you want to collaborate. But that is me, Amit. Thank you so much. That was really neat to kind of see um, <clears throat> that sort of collaborative and uh, effort around you know, using the industry. You know, we wanted to balance this conversation with uh, a lot of what was just shared with a, a, a little bit of a deeper um, look at what community engagement looks like and how that community engagement, you know, and initiatives that are needed to be able to achieve that, um, um, specifically around clinical strategies that I'm going to share with you. So really quick, you know, Care Oregon, you know, who we are, what we're doing, how we're doing, um, the what. Super simple. So our mission, why we exist, you know, inspire and partner to create quality and equity for individual community health and where we're going, healthy communities for all individuals, regardless of income or social circumstances. You know, I feel like uh, COVID, I, I, I like to say over and over again, um, was just a slip cover of, you know, what we've known in our 28 year history, especially, you know, in Oregon and across the communities that we serve is, you know, the populations that are there and the vulnerabilities that were exposed so dramatically during COVID were the areas and strategies and initiatives and industry partners and, and collaborators and basically every tool and thing that we could think of at Care Oregon, we, we try to use um, to manage the, the, the safety net and um, to be able to do interventions for the population that we serve. Oops. So just really quick, you know, uh, Care Oregon, um, as we described earlier, you know, is organized a little bit different um, in Oregon um, around how we do our care. Um, it's a CCO model, a coordinated care model of how the Medicaid is um, really organized. And that was meant to be community driven and the community identifying what are the needs are of the populations and then how does the health plan or the CCO for that matter be able to kind of meet those plans and initiatives and, and be able to use, as I said, whatever tool possible to be able to get that done. So we participate in Medicaid. Um, we're the largest uh, dual plan in the state. We do dental, behavioral health, as well as we have our own um, uh, uh, house-based, home-based primary care, palliative care, and hospice, as well as doing the tribal care coordination for the state. And when you take all of those things into consideration, really what it is is it's about partnering to be able to deliver care um, and collaborate with multiple people for about a half million Oregonians. 
So what I wanted to do was, you know, in the introduction, there was all these departments they listed that are, that are there. So I was trying to think of ways where, how can I share with the respective departments the initiatives that we're really working on and, and how that demonstrates to all of you the collaboration that's really needed to be able to do this work. And when we talk about the Department of Quality and Innovation Support, you know, a lot of the work we wound up doing was around provider stabilization and, and network stabilization that we had to wind up doing. And that included funding, you know, close to $15 million for the providers during COVID to keep them stabilized and the safety net that was really needed to be stabilized during that time. And then really centering everything around equity. You know, and how are we gonna really, you know, look at quality metrics and use the tools and platforms that are available to be able to look at things in an equity lens. We heard earlier in the CEO roundtable in the meeting before around the use of the data and, and race and ethnicity and the real D data. And so we know we have access to that, but how do we use platforms that we have um, to manage our claims data, to manage the social health data, as was mentioned, uh, things like Unite Us, and different industry partners that we use, um, real-time notification for ED and inpatient, the collective platform. How do we use these various platforms to be able to integrate the data and share it to be able to create the impact that we really need to do around health equity? During COVID, we saw you know, um, COPD, you know, um, uh, inpatient admissions, you know, um, obviously getting worse. But when we looked at it with the lens of people of color, we saw that the outcomes were significantly worse. So that kind of drove us to this initiative, well, what are we gonna do and how did the data help us with that? Um, direct uh, system support, which is teams working uh, with clinics in clinics. Telehealth, and we talked a lot about telehealth and what CMS um, approved from an emergency perspective um, during the pandemic. But what we did as a health plan was really work with the telehealth vendors and work with our network to be able to be, continue the payment for those services. Um, you know, beyond um, what was readily available. And that included often telephonic, um, which we know was a, a big issue for rural areas. Um, <clears throat> and then VBP, working with safety net providers to move from fee-for-service RAP payments, you know, to risk, to really thinking about total cost of care and how we were able to do that. But I think importantly, working with those providers and those networks that are culturally specific, those providers that are, um, in a lot of ways, doing some of the most important work in the most vulnerable populations, but often are invisible in, in the gaps and not being focused on the industries that are available there because they're small and the impact is not necessarily visible. So we spent a lot of time um, working with um, folks, especially in behavioral health around culturally specific providers and being able to use our VBP and the platforms we do to do value-based payment to really work with our partners and collaborators in the industry to say, you know, we have to look at these populations and these providers as well, not just the largest people, the largest group of providers, the largest specialists, but some of these folks that should be able to harness your platform, your uh, da data, your analytics, the tools that are offered often only to the largest um, folks with largest plans or largest uh, um, provider groups. And then population health really, you know, thinking beyond case and care management and really making data a priority to the most vulnerable population. And then focusing on social um, health, you know, traditional care workers, um, community health workers, health resilience specialists, using Unite Us, housing and food, you know, really using um, industries like Mom's Meals, um, you know, and, and other vendors that are out there to really focus in on the populations that need um, to be able to do that. Um, and then housing, you know, thinking of it both acute and long-term. So acute is what kind of transitionary housing that's needed and what's long-term needed for housing. And being able to work with the community and, and entities like local government, housing authority, and being able to say to ourselves, the things that we would do traditionally around housing in a CMO division is care coordination. But what if Care Oregon was able to help fund initiatives and even physical space um, as opposed to doing the traditional, you know, care coordination, care management type of things. Um, and then working on community paramedicine, being able to fund with the local fire departments and, and different emergency providers to be able to provide those services in the community. And then really creating a proactive um, outreach team to really approach um, delay in care and, and working on that. 
behavioral health, lots of network stabilization and working with partners to really take the behavioral health network that we have and creating a program that's around strategic health impact um, and really working on a $23 million five-year plan to be able to stabilize that network and, and be able to have them grow. For them to be able to use things like EHR platforms, data exchange, and all the platforms and tools out there, but never having the infrastructure to be able to do that administrative work because they're so busy seeing the patients and the demand that's there. Um, and SUD, especially um, closing the disparity gaps, you know, racial and rural funded coast in, in the coastal part of our service area, really working on doing something with the community around funding a methadone clinic, um, you know, as opposed to doing the services, but really providing the dollars that are needed to be able to do that work. And then dental, you know, really integrating oral physical behavioral health, and then really thinking about oral health being same as kindergarten readiness which is really the same as social health intervention and looking at dental very differently and how we approach that. And then pharmacy, obviously talking about medication trauma, you know, really about how do we access things differently in the safety net versus going to the actual pharmacy and using our PBM. Um, we do use Optum for our PBM and working very closely with Optum around how do we do things in an innovative way that's different for this population that's really vulnerable and really working um, on an innovation program with Optum around dollars and credits that we receive to do experimental and innovative strategies to be able to meet the patient where they need to be or the member where they need to meet to be able to get the medications that they need to. And it's a pretty novel program. I happy to share with anyone afterwards when we have more time. Um, and then really medical management, you know, payment integrity and real system barriers, really talking beyond PA, like really medical management is not just that, it's about utilization management and thinking about addressing things with our hospital systems and so forth as related to ED boarding, right? And, and the psychiatric uh, burden that our ERs have had and how we really address that part. And then house call providers, our home-based system, really trying to address the delay in um, you know, palliative and end of life care. And, and focusing time around that and using how do we get the tools of, for example, the PULST, you know, um, advanced directives. How do we have that information exchange occur so people know to access this service as soon as possible when it's our member? And really spending time around that data exchange. So super quick, data is everything from my perspective. <laughs> you heard that in the previous meeting. And that's a major focus and initiative for us. You know, moving in the predictive population segment, uh, segmentation using machine learning integration of social health data and focus on disparity spotlights on the gaps in care to drive interventions. Super quick, you know, subpopulation goals that we use the data to drive around these categories and, and it's really about, you know, trying to do initiatives that are based on that. And looking at it in a very different way of how our priority populations and the various ways that we uh, align our strategies uh, with it. But I think the important part is, is how we got to the data the way we did and the data part that we did was you know, through the various vendors that I described and folks that we have doing work with us for various means, tools and vendors that are doing specific interventions and how we use the data those vendors have together to collaborate to be able to pro, um, demonstrate the kind of data and subpopulation focus we need to do. So there's a lot in there around data sharing and, and, and health exchange, especially with our industry partners. So thank you. Thank <clears throat> you. So we have a few questions that I will pitch to our panelists and then we'll open things up for audience Q&A. Um, so we heard from both of you about the very interesting and transformative work that you're doing and also the importance of both data sharing and data collection and also with partnerships. Um, can you share some of the lessons learned um, along the way, what's proven successful, what has um, maybe required being a little bit more nimble and making adjustments to uh, work towards success and, and just your experiences with, with implementation and go down the line. Yeah, I mean, you know, I always say when we, when we work with a vendor at Care Oregon, especially around data, I always tell them that there's three things that we're looking, or I'm looking for and we're looking for. One is the ability and interest in taking risk. The second is to innovate, and then the third is to partner and have a relationship. And I think a lot of the data vendors and platforms, 
that they do have, in my opinion, a very narrow focus around what they're trying to have their platform do. And when we take a step back and say, how do we look at the data that you have in here? And are you willing to innovate with us and really try to figure out how to use this data differently? And most of the time, we can kind of get them there. And, and those partners that are willing to do that, we've found some really incredible work and outcomes from it and impacts that have happened that we wouldn't have been able to discover without that journey together. I think that is both the opportunity, but it's also what a barrier is. Because often, you know, you won't have vendors or partners that want to take a risk beyond the typical contract that they would have with, you know, whoever they're partnering with. They don't want to innovate or they don't necessarily feel like that's their business or they have the budget to do that. And then um, those that want to have more of an administrative contractual relationship is very different than having a deep collaborative relationship to kind of improve the work that you want to do. Yeah, for us, um, uh, you know, thinking about that question and lessons learned and our model and, you know, just thinking about what has really attributed to our success, I think it's two things. One is picking the right convener and the other is um, the picking the right message, really. And so the first, picking the right convener, we, in the examples that you heard, we very specifically picked IHA, PBGH, health leads, like these different folks that you heard about because we wanted folks in the industry who were nonpartisan, who was respected by those that we were trying to get at the table and get alignment from, um, who already had working relationships with those people as well. Um, that was really important. And one of the big things is, you know, we had established while we were contracting them for you know leading this work we also had to establish our own relationships with these organizations because again they are nonpartisan and they they do have working relationships with everyone in the ecosystem and so a lot of that that work takes a lot of upfront time to make sure you get the foundations right of the work moving forward and so for anyone that is looking for a quick movement in this type of work that you know the work that I sort of presented on um, getting alignment from industry stakeholders, there, there is no quick. You have to really make sure you're picking the right convener, that um, you're also establishing the right relationship with those conveners. It's not a vendor sort of partnership per se. It's, it's very different. You're trying to strategically move something um, that's complicated. Um, and that leads to number two, which is the right messaging. Um, again, I touched upon like how we think about our panels and how do we have people who aren't um, the ones who are always talking about payment innovation at events, right? How to make it not so wonky so people just understand it. How to make it more buzzy so you get more people to come out and listen to the messaging. Um, all of that stuff is really, really important in this work and in changing like hearts and minds. And kind of building off of um, things that don't move very quickly and that require um, alignment and nonpartisanship. Um, are there any policy initiatives or changes at the federal or state levels that can assist with um, some of the, the goals that your organizations are working on? Um, Shruti, I know you remember, you mentioned um, a health information exchange bill that you all were working on, um, but are there other policy um, initiatives that you all are working on that would help maybe overcome existing regulatory barriers or that would help facilitate the work that your organizations are doing? Yeah, I mean, with data sharing, the plug here is there's a lot of work on the federal and state level in California for based in California. Um, and my invitation for all of you is to join the Connecting for Better Health Coalition if you have not heard, if you're based in California um, at the state level. But while we did get um, the, the, the trailer bill passed, there's still a lot of work to do around advocating for funding and infrastructure and all the different things. So join Connecting for Better Health. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I, I guess I would just add that I think there's probably two things. One is obviously the data sharing is a huge, huge part of it. But I also think too that um, there are ways to be able to get the data and use the data if you have, once again, a willing partner. And, and folks that want to collaborate, think outside the box, and really take a little bit of a risk and innovate with what you have available. You know, I, I like to say that you know we're, we're looking for directional accuracy, not precision. You know, to, when we be able to do it. I think the second area is you mentioned about the regulatory. I think there's a lot of work um, that has been talked about and discussed, but more that needs to be done 
around some of the regulatory requirements that are in some ways very important, but in other ways are so burdensome and are so over administrative and are distractor from the kind of care modeling you need. I'll give you an example. Um, for care management and care coordination, the requirements that the state has for you requires you to do a model that often is 20 years old. It's not the kind of care model that's needed for certain populations. So you need to kind of change the dial around that. And then lastly, you know, I do think um, the quality metrics and incentive programs that are um, out there, I mean, there's about a million of them, and yet we still have equity, um, disparities, all these things like real D data and stuff that is not being prioritized. That should be what is being incentivized, not some of the kind of measurement sets and, and things that we have right now that we're being held to that take the energies away from where the focus should be. And I think there's a lot of policy advocacy that could happen in that way to say, we need to stop measuring what we're measuring right now and really get innovative and think about what's really important. Yeah, thank you, great, great answers. We need to get you guys on um, Capitol Hill and DC to come. <laughs> I was just going to add to that too in terms of, I do think that there's such a, so one thing about my background is, you know, I've, I've come from quality, then I worked at startups, and I worked in venture capital, and then I came here. And the reason I, that's the career trajectory is because at each one, it felt like a block, right? In quality, it was like, oh, we need more innovation, went to innovation, and it was like, oh, we need other more diverse companies being funded, went to venture capital oh, like your companies can't actually scale because there's fundamental policy and industry issues, like go to advocacy and try to change that. Um, but I do think, I mean, to echo what you said, it, we need more people at the table ad advocating that whatever you're focused on, um, you know, be it digitization or be it data sharing or maternal sort of benefits and things like that, whatever it is, at the end of the day, if you don't have the right industry alignment and policies supporting the scale of your innovation, whether you're a funder, a VC, whether you're actually building the innovation, whether you're actually implementing the innovation as a provider or a health plan, um, these are the biggest barriers for any type of scale and change. So um, another yes, join Connecting for Better mm -hmm. Health, but join other coalitions and things too. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Jeffrey Hill from RTI Health Advance and compliment you both on the presentations. And I just have a, a simple but complex question and I was just wondering at what point, how, and how frequently would you begin to evaluate the impact of these interventions and collaborations on health equity? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, impact, impact assessment and evaluation, unfortunately, is like nascent. There's such a difficulty in the healthcare environment to be able to do it from an analytic perspective. And I think that we do it too late. So we, we say we have an intervention, we go through the intervention, and then somehow somebody says, did it do anything? And then we try to go backwards and say, okay, we think we did something, and then a lot of it's qualitative, because you know, I'll say things like, well, of course it made a difference. I can show you this person, right? And then you say, what's the real impact of that? So I think there's two things that are needed. One, it has to start in the beginning. That's when evaluation starts. And then you can really get a sense of what the impact is. I think two, you really, really need to understand what you're trying to achieve. Like you have to start, and you said that really well. What is, what is the goal? What are you trying to achieve? And set that in the very beginning and be able to do that. And the third is, you know, I mean, and this is my opinion, you know, the healthcare industry, they have to wake up and get into the modern data analytic statistical, mathematical tools that every other industry uses. And we have to use that same sort of discipline around math and statistics and science that's out there, machine learning, whatever you know, modalities you want to talk about, we have to use the same thing and have to have the right people to be able to do that. Um, I'll quickly say, you know, uh, my CEO, when he joined the organization, he, he reflected in a meeting with me one time saying, where's the actuaries and why don't you have any working with you on it and I was like well, I don't know I was like I wish I had some so he proceeded to go ahead and get us these folks and it's without tools and science and expertise in there you're not going to be able to get the first two things you do have to have the workforce and the resources to do that and the only thing I would add is 
looking at it from different perspectives of efficacy. That's really important. Sometimes I think we stick in our silos yeah. of, and is it you know effective in this one way we're looking at it, but there's like the payment innovation work, for example, there's multiple, there's a provider perspective, there's a patient perspective, yeah. health plan, so really getting efficacy from all the angles. Yeah, and you know, I like that because I, I like to coin something I call ROI cubed. And, and what it is is return on investment. And this has a lot to do with our CFO because she would always say, I don't see any impact on it because there's no dollar return. And I'd be like, well, there's no dollar return, but there's a quality return. So the three components of it are really a return on investment for cost. Is that what we're talking about? We're trying to reduce cost. Or are we trying to change utilization? And that could be appropriate utilization, like increased behavioral health is a good thing, right? Decrease maybe inpatient. And then the third is quality. And getting really clear, which of those three are you talking about for your impact? Uh, Will Fox from Milliman, and question for Shruti on the data sharing. And let's just say that payers have typically been very protective of their data <coughs> in the past. And so wanted to know, have you describe a little bit more for us, if you got a couple minutes on like, what are the data elements that are in there? How is it going to be shared? And then with price transparency coming out, like our unit prices going to be even in there? And then how does that, probably a bigger question here, the California's got a new APCD. How does that Yeah, I mean, this is HA? a great question. And actually, that, that's a lot of the stuff we're trying to define in the second year. So, so in the, with data sharing, there are a lot of different folks in the ecosystem, right, with, with different kind of perspectives on it. So in, so something that people or they may, you may not know is California has been trying to pass a statewide data sharing mandate for like 25 years, and it has not worked. It's a long time, and these people are like die hard, like, like have been working at it for 25 years. And it's actually kind of amazing the passion behind it, uh, and really like very great intentions of having better coordinated care, da da da. The pandemic highlighted a real need for it, right? And we saw folks like in Nebraska using their HIE for amazing outcomes. Lots of white papers were written about it. So the environment in California was really ripe uh, in 2021 in terms of actually trying to progress and make something pass. Um, but still, it's, it's a very complicated system in California with all the players, and so the, the bill that was passed is there aren't, a, the, the infrastructure of the bill itself, a lot of the things that you just asked are not outlined. So that's how the advocacy continues because the first version um, is a little bit more general and we need more of the specifics that you mentioned. I would just add that I think, you know, it's, you know, COVID and the pandemic, all the awful things that happened with it, the data exchange and data sharing was an opportunity, right? And there was a lot of examples around the vaccination, how public health worked with the health plans and so forth, and, and different vendors we use that shared their data differently. And I think the important part is we shouldn't forget those use cases. And we can use those for future discussions around similar data exchange that's needed. It's just a different topic. But it still creates the point that people through relationships in need were able to share the data and find ways to make it happen. You know, that included yeah. policy. You know, very specific in Oregon, we had to do that work very specific with legislators to be able to get the public health data on vaccine to combine with the health plans claims data so we could outreach to the most vulnerable people. For people who are interested in this topic, Mackenzie did a <clears throat> white paper on it. Jessica, and I'm blanking on her last name right now, wrote it. But Jessica, McKenzie, white paper, HIE, Google it. It's a really good paper on the Nebraska use case and how they, they um, uh, led to really great outcomes. Well, thank you both so much. Um, we have about two minutes left, so we have time for one quick question, if anybody has one. Hi, Dwight French from Red Hat, and just curious how the um, federal ONC and CMS interoperability ruling data sharing plays into what you're talking about. That was passed at the beginning of COVID, so kind of lost a little bit of its luster, but it's a pretty extensive and punitive um, law that requires health plans and providers to be sharing data through APIs. It's a pretty, it was, it's pretty significant for us, you know, certainly at Care Oregon, because, you know, we have to follow those rules, and our state also has a roadmap that we have to follow around exchanging data with our providers, and to me, a lot of that has to do with EHR clinical data. 
Um, and that's a big deal for us because we integrate behavioral health, uh, oral health and physical health, and now social health. And so behavioral health integration of EHR data is a whole other story, let alone the physical health data. So could spend a lot of time on the work that we're doing both from a policy perspective, but also with the vendors, the EHR vendors and the different provider teams to be able to say, where can we share this and how can we share this and what's needed to be created to be able to share that data. But I think it's a, it's a big deal that interoperability rules, at, at least for us, definitely for all the government sponsored programs that we're in. Thank you, and Shruti, I'm sorry to deny you the, um, the opportunity to talk about interoperability. <laughs> um, but we have reached the end of our time today, so please join me in thanking both of our panelists, um, Shruti and Dr. Shaw. <laughs> Wonderful job.